I want to share with you something that you're actually very familiar with, a passage of scripture which is entitled The Parable of the Lost Son. Now I want to read some of the, um, a little bit of that to you, or all of the actual parable to you, and then we'll discuss it. So if you turn with me to Luke chapter 15, and we'll commence in verse 11, we'll do verses... Uh, 11 and 12, sorry, let me go back a little bit further. We're going to do verses 1 and 2, then we'll do, go from 11 on. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them a parable. There was a man, up to verse 11 now, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe. Put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive. Again, he was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. But he answered his father, sorry, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My father, the, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive and he was lost and is found. When we read this parable, we normally concentrate on the younger son. About his leaving home and his return. But is that the real message that these two brothers, who represent two different ways to be alienated from God and a different way to seek acceptance in the kingdom of heaven? There were two groups of people who came to listen to Jesus. There was the tax collectors and sinners. These were the men who corresponded to the younger brother. They observed neither the moral law of the Bible nor the rules for the ceremonial purity followed by the religious Jews. They engaged in wild living. Like the younger brother, they left home, leaving the traditional morality of their families in respectable society. The second group of listeners were the church folk, 
the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. They represent, or well, they were represented by the elder brother. They held to the traditional morality of their upbringing. They studied, they obeyed the scripture, they worshipped faithfully, and they prayed constantly. What is it about Jesus that attracted these while living younger brothers to him? It was something that really upset the Pharisees and the leaders of the church. They couldn't work it out. Why is it that these young people, these people who don't even come to our meetings, they don't care, yet they're attracted to Jesus. What is it? So who is Jesus teaching this parable directed at? It's really the second group. It's the scribes and the Pharisees. It is in, their, in response to their attitude that he tells this parable. The parable of the two brothers of the two sons takes an extended look at the soul of the elder brother and climaxes with a powerful plea for him to change his heart. Normally we concentrate on the younger brother and that's what most people seem to want to do. The targets of this story are not the wayward sinners but religious people who do everything the Bible requires. Jesus is not pleading with, not so much with immoral, immoral outsiders but as with the moral insiders. He wants to show them their blindness, their narrowness, their self-righteousness and how these things are destroying both their own lives and the souls of the people around them. It's a mistake to think that Jesus tells this story primarily to assure younger brothers of his unconditional love. Through this parable, Jesus challenges what nearly everyone has thought about God, sin and salvation. His story reveals the destructive self-centeredness of the younger brother, but also condemns the elder brother's moralistic life in strong terms. Jesus is saying that both the irreligious and the religious are spiritually lost. Both life paths are dead ends, and that every thought the human race has had about how to connect with God has been wrong. They're fairly strong words. But both older brothers and younger brothers are with us today. They're in the same society, they're often in the same family, and often in the same church. More and more people today consider themselves non-religious, or maybe we'd put it down as irreligious or even anti-religious, they believe that the moral issues are highly complex and are suspicious of individuals or institutions that claim moral authority. There's a rise of the secular spirit, people who don't want anything to do with church, and they take a dim view of religion and people who push that side of things. So whose side is Jesus on? On the, the younger brother or the elder brother? Do we have an answer for that? He's not on either side. He's not on the side of the religious or the irreligious. You know, when Christianity first started, it wasn't called a religion. They were just followers of Jesus. We use the term religion. To most people in our society, religion or Christianity is a religion and moralism. And to the other side is secularism. Yet it seems that it was the religious people when Jesus was on the earth who were the ones who offended him not the irreligious or the wayward people as the um, religious people would have said. It was the outcasts who Jesus seemed to draw like a magnet. They came to him. We've got many stories in the Bible where we find this happening. 
it's usually the religious person who is not happy with Jesus and it's the outcast that is, whether it be a sexual outcast, a political outcast or a racial outcast. They respond. What is it about Jesus? They're the ones who connect with Jesus and the elder brother doesn't. And Jesus said to the religious leaders of his time, the tax collectors and the prostitutes enter the kingdom before you do. That's found in Matthew 21, 31. Jesus teaches consistently, teaching consistently attracted the irreligious while offending the Bible-believing religious people. What about us today? Who do we draw to our church? It's usually the people who join churches, generally speaking, are the ones who are straight, they're moral and they're conservative. I don't, don't know about you where you would put yourself in this category. Maybe we're not declaring the message that Jesus did. So if our churches aren't appealing to the younger brothers, maybe we need to see what it is that is wrong with us. This parable could be termed the parable of the two lost sons rather than the parable of the prodigal son. In Act 1 we see the lost younger brother then in Act 2 we have the lost elder brother. If you Keep your eyes on Luke 15 and in verse 12 we find that the younger brother decides that he wanted his share of the estate. And when did he want it? Now. So he goes to his father and asks for just that. And back in their day the um, culture and the social standing was that when the father had two sons and when he died he would give the older son two-thirds of the uh, estate and one-third to the younger son. But this younger son goes to his father completely out of order and out of... It's actually a sign of deep disrespect and it was the same as wishing him dead. He didn't want the father himself. He wanted the things that the father had. So... How would you have responded if you were the father? In this case, in their culture, the father would have probably hit him around the ears and sent him on his way. But no, that's not what happened. He actually gave him his share. Now, I can identify a little bit with this in the sense of the land in their day, it was the father's life. And to be able to give him his share of the inheritance before he's dead is like tearing his life apart. And he would have to actually sell some of his land to be able to give him the financial money, the equivalent of, to get his share. Which he does. And so what does the son do? He heads off to a far country and he enjoyed life. He lived it to the full. It doesn't really tell us a lot of what he was up to, but I imagine he had plenty of friends, plenty of parties, and while the money was flowing, the friends were great. But what happens when the money stops flowing? The friends just seem to disappear. And that's what we see happening. Suddenly, there's a famine in the land. He's got nothing to eat. And he goes looking for work. And he's given work in a pig pen. Of all things for a Jewish person to be working in the pig pens. It's unclean, pigs run clean, and it's the ultimate indignity for them. While he's there in the pig pen, he begins to think, you know, back home, Dad had plenty of food and there was always somebody there and he starts thinking through his mind, what can I do? He formulates a plan. And part of the plan was, this is confession time. 
I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to confess and tell him, I want you, please, to put me on as one of your hired men because the hired men who worked for his father would live in the village and work on the estate. His aim was, if you put me on as a hired man, you can pay me, then I can pay you back. He wanted to earn his way back into his father's favour. Earn his way back into his father's favour. So he got all this in his head and he worked out what he was going to do. Admit he was wrong. He knew he'd forfeited his right to be his son. So he heads off. And as the story goes, in verse 20, we'll take it up again there in verse 20. So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Wow. Here's the father. And fathers in their culture didn't run. He would have pulled up his long robe and he ran to greet his son. The son responds. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's as far as he gets. And the father comes in and says, But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The significance, the robe, what robe would he have got for him? to be his own robe, a long robe of distinction. What about the ring? It's a signet ring. In their time, to seal something, they'd put it into wax and put it onto the, the letter or whatever the contract was. A ring of authority. And then sandals, put sandals on his feet. All the slaves were bare feet. Now, he's given him full rights back. He's now been taken back into the family with all the rights. And to give the fatted calf, we often say that at our place, we're going to have the fatted calf. But what is the significance of the fatted calf? The fatted calf was something they only had when a major occasion or a major feast was on because that was very expensive. They might have a goat or something small. So when the fatted calf was killed, not just the family was there, the whole village, everybody around came. It was party time. It was party time. How many of you like parties? We all do, I think. But now we come to the elder brother. And this part of the parable really challenges the mindset of the elder brothers with a startling message. They've suddenly realised that God's Love and forgiveness can pardon and restore any and every kind of sin or wrongdoing. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. It doesn't matter if you're deliberately oppressed or even murdered people or how much you've abused yourself. The younger brother knew that his father's house, there was abundant food to spare. But he also discovered there was grace to spare as well. There is no evil that the father's love cannot pardon and cover there is no sin that is a match for his grace. So the act one there demonstrates the lavish prodigality of God's grace. Jesus shows the father pouncing on his son in love, not only before he has a chance to clean himself up, but an evidence of a changed heart. Even before he can recite his repentance speech, Nothing, not even abject contrition, meets the merit, merits the favour of God. The Father's love is absolutely free. Absolutely free. We need to hang on to that. What about the lost elder brother, though? What's he doing? He, he suddenly, he's out in the field, he hears the music... And he comes back and he's wondering, what is going on? So he talks to one of the servants and then he gets the story. 
When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So, what happens? The father goes out to talk to the elder brother. This brings disgrace on the father again. This forces the father to speak to his older son. A demeaning thing to have to do when you're the lord of the manor and a host of a great feast. But why is the older son so furious? Why is he so upset? What is it that makes him so angry? Probably one of the reasons. The younger brother's been reinstated, so instead of him now getting two-thirds when his father dies, he's only going to get a portion of what's left because his brother's going to get another section when, he, when it all happens again. So he's really furious. And he says to his father, you've never even given me a goat for a party. How dare you give him the calf? What was it that was really upsetting the older brother? Was there any justice in what the father was doing? So the elder brother's fury leads him to insult the father further. Look, he says, look, I've obeyed you, I've done everything that you've asked of me and you've never, ever given me anything special. This son of yours, he didn't call him his brother, he didn't even acknowledge that he was his brother. He says, this son of yours. But the father says, I still want you to come into the feast. I wonder what the listeners thought as they heard the end of this story as such. It's like a cliffhanger. Is the elder brother going to be reunited in the family with the younger brother and his father? We don't know. Jesus doesn't tell us the answer. So which, how do we look at it? Jesus is redefining everything we thought we knew about connecting to God. He's redefining sin, what it means to be lost and what it means to be saved. What was the older brother doing? He was earning his father's favour. The elder brother in the parable illustrates the way of moral conformity. The Pharisees of Jesus' day believed that while they were people chosen of God, they could only maintain their place in, this, in his blessing and receive final salvation through strict obedience to the Bible. There are innumerable varieties of this paradigm, but they all believe in putting the will of God and the standards of the community ahead of individual fulfilment. In this view, we can only attain happiness in a world made right by achieving moral rectitude. We may fall at times, of course, but then we will be judged by how abject and intense our regret is. In this view, even our failures, we must measure up. The younger brother, he likes the way of self-discovery. He's going to go out there and just live it up and search the world and find the good way to be. And a lot of people today work on that basis. You know, I'm in control, I, whatever I want to do, I do. I don't behold to anybody. The person in the way of moral conformity says, I'm not going to do what I want, I'm going to do what's expected of me. Our Western society is deeply divided between these two approaches. You've got the, I'll use the word, the good people and the bad people. The bad people see the good people as bad and the good people see the... Did I get that the right way around? <laughs> yeah, the, the bad people, which they get themselves crossed over. That's the way I want to put it to you. Because they th we all think we're right, whatever situation we find ourselves in. We think we're, we're, we're right and everybody else is wrong. But is that what Jesus is saying to us? What, is that what he's telling us here? I don't believe it is. 
Don't believe it is at all. You see, what's happening is the younger brother, what he was trying to do was manipulate his father. What is the older brother doing? He's doing exactly the same. He's trying to manipulate his father. And as I thought about that, I've only recently come to this conclusion, I'm thinking, how about me? How about us? We can be so busy being right, doing all the right things, but in reality, we're manipulating God because if we do the right thing, if we keep the law, if we go to church every week, if we eat right and do all these things, God, I've done this for you, what are you going to do for me? And that's as bad as the younger brother who, I'm going to do my own thing, no matter, I don't care what you think, that's just the way it is. So both of them are in the same camp. They're really trying to earn, well, they're not trying to earn their salvation, they're missing out on salvation because they, their focus is on themselves, not on Jesus as their saviour. And that's the point I want to make to you this morning. We need to keep our focus on Jesus, not on the things that we do per se, as our means to an end. Things will take place because we see the Saviour, what he's done for us, and that's what I believe this story of the, good, of the prodigal son is all about. Jesus wants us to see him. We need to come to him and search him because he knows our heart. We probably know our own hearts reasonably well, but Jesus knows it even better. So this morning my prayer is that each of us, as we look at the younger brother who we know senses his need and he comes back to his father and is reinstated. And we know of stories of people who have done that and sometimes their actual testimony is dramatic. But then many of us can be sitting in a church with all these things happening around us but have we really put Jesus first in our lives or are we just fitting into all these things that we feel we should do and they're not actually wrong per se, but you've got to get Jesus first, then these other things will add together. That's my prayer this morning.